everyone. So after a lot of conversation and listening and learning, it's always lovely to hear from you. Um, so we have some polling questions that we'd love all of you to engage with. Um, it is gonna show up on the screen uh, now. Um, the first one is related to something we heard earlier this afternoon. If you guys could all check out the QR code and do some voting, but we wanna know which aspect of rare disease care is the most crucial for nonprofit organizations to address in order to improve patient outcomes. And it seems that there is clearly two things that take priority, and that is increasing access to existing treatments and therapies. Nope, it's now the winner. Um, and, you know, advocating for policy changes and increased research funding, that's always important. Um, there, here's a tie, I like this. And then enhancing di diagnostic tools and reducing the time to diagnose. But so I, I think it's clear that increasing access is, um, is the priority here. Now the second question is how effective are patient advocacy groups in improving the journey of patients with rare diseases? Very effective. Closing, on, closing in on somewhat effective. <laughs> I love it. I think at the end of the day, um, it is a positive um, in terms of e efficacy of what patient advocacy groups are doing. Now our next question is, what is the most effective approach to increase the representation of women in high ranking national security positions? Um, we heard earlier from the former president of the General Assembly who moderated the conversation, Maria Fernanda Espinoza. Um, and we have a couple of um, they all gave their, their suggestions at the end. It was implementing targeted leadership development programs for women, creating policies that mandate gender diversity and security roles, increasing public awareness and support for female leaders in security, or focusing on merit-based promotions without specific diversity targets. How are you all feeling? Okay. We're in a tie. You know, to a certain extent, these are all incredibly important to do, but I do like seeing that the implementation of targeted leadership development um, is coming out ahead. And then we have, uh, we have two more left, so get ready to keep using your phones. Which strategy would you choose to build resilience in global trade and supply chains and geopolitical tensions? Are we diversifying supply sources and developing local production capabilities, increasing tariffs and trade barriers to protect local industries? Are we centralizing supply chain management to, stream, uh, to streamline operations or real, uh, relying on geopolitical alliances? All right, strong winner for diversifying supply sources and developing local production capabilities. And finally, um, what is the need, what is needed to address major health challenges such as cervical cancer and cardiovascular disease in low resource settings? Increased access to preventive measures and early detection technologies is a strong tie with implementing national policies that mandate comprehensive health care coverage and um, focusing on public education and awareness campaigns. Oh, and then out of nowhere, <laughs> nowhere, enhanced cross-sector partnerships um, has emerged as the priority. Thank you guys all for participating in this. We are very excited um, to welcome the next uh, panel, which is actually focused around health. It's called A Global First, A Blueprint for Eliminating Cervical, Cervical Cancer in the Americas session in partnership with the Pan American Health Organization. This session will have speakers who will highlight the progress being made by countries in the Americas and explore the role of different sectors in bringing HPV vaccines, screening and treatment technologies to more women and girls. It is a pleasure to welcome Catherine Bliss and our esteemed panel to the stage.
So for many of us, the word cancer, especially if it's used on ourselves or with respect to a loved one, makes our blood run cold. It's really a fear of the unknown. What caused it? Could it have been prevented? Are there tests? Are there effective treatments? Will I or my loved one die? But while there may be many unknowns in the world of cancer prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, there is a great deal that is known about cervical cancer, which globally claims the lives of more than 350,000 women each year. We know that it's one of a handful of cancers understood to be caused by a virus, in this case, the human papillomavirus. We know that there are effective vaccines, tests, and treatments. And we know that these factors make cervical cancer the first cancer to be considered possible to eliminate. I'm Catherine Bliss, Senior Fellow with the CSIS Global Health Policy Center in Washington, D.C., and welcome to today's discussion about the opportunity to eliminate cervical cancer in the region of the Americas. Now, of the 40,000 women in the region who die from cervical cancer each year, more than 80% live in Latin America and the Caribbean. The highest burden is in countries and communities with the least resources. In 2018, the region adopted an ambitious plan to eliminate cervical cancer. And through it, governments recognized that without multi-sectoral action to improve equitable access to prevention, testing, and treatment, cervical cancer cases and deaths in the region would increase dramatically thanks to population growth, demographic shifts, and behavioral change. Can the Americas become the first region in the world to eliminate cervical cancer or any kind of cancer? Let's find out. I'm very pleased to introduce Jarvis Barbosa, Director of the Pan American Health Organization, Violaine Mitchell, Director of Immunizations at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Monica Garcia, Minister of Health from Spain. Let's dive right in. We have a short period of time, we could spend days on this topic, but let's get started. So Dr. Barbosa, let's start with you. We've already lost a generation of women to cervical cancer. There are still 40,000 deaths in the region each year, but there are now highly effective vaccines, HPV tests, the self-tests, and effective treatments if the cancer is detected in time. So why have you prioritized cervical cancer elimination during your tenure as PAHO director? And what makes you optimistic that it is possible to eliminate cervical cancer across the region and really protect future generations? Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I think that the <coughs> I am optimistic because firstly, we have a long standing history in this region of leading the world to eliminate diseases. We were the first one to eliminate the polio, measles, and other diseases. Second, I think that we have a, a very strong commitment from our member states. We already have 48 countries and territories in the Americas that are using HPV vaccine, only three. We are missing only three that we will get them on board until next year. Uh, in this region, 94% of the girls live in a country that have access to HPV vaccine, mostly because you have a PAHO's revolving fund offering a vaccine, high quality vaccine by an affordable price. But we also are seeing that many countries are already establishing national plans, ministers are making commitment. So I think that we can uh, really be the first region in the world to eliminate cervical cancer. It's not possible that having the tools and the strategies that we cannot uh, we cannot eliminate a disease that every day, every day, 100 women die of a cervical cancer, cancer in Latin America and the Caribbean. And as you mentioned, it's not a, uh, it's not a random uh, number. We have these women are women that live in the slums, in the big cities, rural areas, women from indigenous populations. So I think that for a public health perspective, but also to promote equity, I think that is an obligation to em embrace this cause. So you've really talked about the importance of new technologies, innovative tools, but also national plans and regional solidarity and really bringing those, those three elements together. Minister Garcia, I wanna turn to you. Um, you know, Spain has really placed a great deal of emphasis on improving access to cervical cancer prevention and treatment 
in domestic programs. And Spain is also focusing on international challenges, including by making a series of commitments at the first global forum on cervical cancer elimination this past March in Cartagena in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So could you say a little bit about how Spain is leveraging its own expertise and resources to support cervical cancer elimination in the region of the Americas? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, for Spain, cervical cancer represents a global public health issue uh, that requires coordination action uh, among countries based on cooperation and uh, the recognition of our interdependence. Better global health means better health in each country. And that's why we collaborated with the government of Colombia in organizing the first World Forum for the uh, Elimination of uh, Cervical Cancer held in Colombia. This event allowed us to bring uh, strategies to the table to eliminate cervical cancer globally and reach commitments for collaboration with the WHO 2020 Elimination Strategy. So, uh, as part of this commitment uh, and the Spain Global Outlook, uh, we will contribute through the Spanish Agency for International Development Cooperation with uh, 10 million euros uh, over the coming years to help improve vaccine coverage, train healthcare professionals, and enhance uh, prevention and early detection efforts to advance uh, the elimination of cervical cancer, we need to focus in three key areas. First, improving vaccination coverage, of course, such as through the single dose strategy uh, proposed by the WHO were implemented and incorporating men into this program. Second, uh, increasing participation in early detection programs to offer effective health care for the population. And third, last but not least, uh, reducing health inequalities because that affect vaccination coverage, participation in screening programs and health, counts, and health outcomes. We believe that uh, such meetings such, uh, and partnerships are essential to ensure that the progress we make toward elimination uh, cervical cancer has a global impact and also reduce disparities between countries. To improve global health, we need spaces like this where governments, civil society, donors, and multila multilateral institutions can come together, making collaboration as effective as possible and ensuring it reaches uh, all people worldwide. Without this co co cooperation, achieving the elimination goal would be more difficult, both globally and nationally. So you've really talked about the importance of addressing inequities within countries, but also some of the imbalances that we see between countries and between mm -hmm. regions, and yeah. really using the, the new tools that we have to, to remedy those, those disparities. The Elaine Mitchell, let me, let me turn to you. You know, both um, Dr. Barbosa and, and Minister um, Garcia have raised the importance of, of really looking at equity as, as an aspect of the elimination program. And, you know, as we see in the Americas, not only is it you know, the populations in some of the lowest income countries that are struggling with the burden of cervical cancer, but even in the, the middle and high income countries in the region, we see um, pockets of, of inequality and, and disparities that, that really make the, um, the elimination agenda a challenge. And so I wanted to ask you from your perspective with the foundation to say a bit about the, the ways in which we can begin to ensure access, equitable access to some of these new tools and the role that partnerships can play in doing so. Well, first off, thank you, Catherine, very much. And thank you to Pahu for inviting me. This is a subject uh, we are deeply passionate about um, and for me personally as well. I think I'd like to make uh, three points, if I may. The first is that cervical cancer elimination is doable. This isn't a pipe dream. This is something we absolutely can do. We have a highly effective vaccine, more than 95% efficacious. We have a recommendation from the WHO from PAHO in 2023 for a single dose uh, vaccine. We have 58 countries who've now adopted this, including in the region uh, Mexico. 
We have brand new diagnostics coming down the pike and already in use, as well as treatment uh, programs. So this is utterly doable within our reach. The second point I'd like to make is actually a thank you to Pajo and the Pajo region. Dr. Barbosa, you noted the pathfinder role the Americas have played, but I think back to smallpox, to polio, to measles. Pajo set out in the Americas what actually became what the rest of the world emulated. So I really believe that this movement of cervical cancer elimination is timely. I had the privilege of being in Cartagena, the first cervical cancer forum. I really want to thank PAHO, the governments of Spain and Colombia for hosting this with WHO, UNICEF, many partners. This was extraordinary and really pleased that the government of Indonesia has stood up now to actually invite the world to um, Indonesia next June. But I think what Cartagena was also so unique about was bringing together the cancer and vaccination immunization communities. And I embarrassingly, I might say for the first time. So a tremendous milestone. And then my, the third point I'd like to, sh to make is, and maybe for many of you in the room, you know, but cervical cancer is a horrendous disease. It is painful, it is terrible. It cuts women down in the absolute prime of their lives. It leaves maternal orphans, it leaves families devastated and communities without valuable members. It's absolutely ridiculous. It, it's horrendous what actually this disease has done and does every day with 100 women dying each day. But what do we do? And this is where I think um, your, to your question about partnership, it is about partnership, about what each and everyone can bring. National governments, civil society, foundations like ourselves, multilaterals, collectively the private sector is critical, but working together we really can absolutely make this a thing of the past. And I think in terms of equity, there is nothing that is going to advance equity more than ensuring that the women we're losing today, 350,000 women globally, never die in the future. So thank you. So all of you have in one way or another really touched on the, the history and the the legacy of the, the important disease elimination campaigns of the past around smallpox in particular. And PAHO, of course, played, has played such a strong role. I mean, the, in the region of the Americas you know, has been a leader and not just with smallpox, but polio and measles elimination and, and so, many, so many others. And Jarvis Barbosa, I wanted to, to start with you just to say a, a little bit more, if you would, about some of the lessons from the elimination um, campaigns really over the past you know, 70 or so years. You know, many of them have been successful, but there have been some challenges as well. And what, you know, not necessarily just in this region, but, but globally. And so what, what lessons can be taken from some of those historical examples that can be relevant for, for this moment? That's a very good <coughs> question, Catherine. I think that first we need to have the political commitment. So I think that I'm very happy when I see that the countries like El Salvador, a small country in Central America, uh, receiving devices that will allow the primary health care to, to be performing the, the ablative uh, treatment for women. I'm very happy when I see that 25 countries in our region have already fallen the recommendation to move it to one, one dose regime mm -hmm. of HPV. And they are not reducing the volume of vaccines. They are vaccinating more. They are va vaccinating boys, for instance. Mm -hmm. But we have some challenges and partnerships are very important. The new tests that you mentioned, and these tests are a, a game changer because it's much, much better tested they can be used as a self-test, so this will remove a huge barrier for the women. Only 10 countries are using this test in the region. Why? Because most countries cannot afford the current price that the, the producers are charging for this test. So if we don't have this kind of commitment from not only the government, the societies, the private sector, I think that we can move forward and can make, I think, that this very important achievement for the, the women and the families, communities in our region that is to eliminate cervical cancer. So you've raised you know, 
two points that that I think are, are important across many of the different lessons, or three really, I mean, the, the importance of partnerships between organizations like WHO, national governments, and civil society, also the important role of financing, but at the same time, you know, really um, understanding how people will use technologies or how, you know, what, what is comfortable for people to use, what people will, uh, what women will, will be able to access and, and be able to use on a routine basis. Minister Garcia, let me ask you what you see as, as some of the important lessons that, that can be relevant in this particular moment. No, I think um, when we want to evaluate the progress of our efforts in eliminating um, cervical cancer, we need to set both short-term and uh, long-term goals. No, it's, it's different. First, we need to assess whether the resources uh, we allocate are improving our vac vaccination coverage at the last, uh, at least one dose, uh, aiming to reach as many cohorts as possible, always with, uh, as you said, the equity-focused um, approach. We know, and you told, uh, that in general people with lower incomes participate less in preventive activities, whether in screening programs or vaccination programs. Therefore, any elimination strategy uh, must assess in success by considering the impact on reducing health inequalities. In Spain, for, her, for example, in the last uh, 10 years, we have, uh, the, we have a, a percentage of uh, 15 years uh, girls uh, who had received the recommended dose of HPV vaccine from uh, 58% in 20, uh, 2012 to 80% in 2022. So, and now we are um, we are vaccinating uh, men since uh, 2023. Another short-term goal is to improve partici participation in cervical cancer screening program, and we have to improve that. No? And in the long term, the goals we need to set include achieving uh, optimal coverage levels with the complete HPV vaccination schedule. Secondly, ensuring comprehensive follow-up to that women and a comprehensive care for those who require more specific attention with the healthcare system. So uh, these three pillars uh, are essential to advancing for elimination of the cancer, and we need to study the barriers to uh, remove the barriers present in each country. For this reason, the participation of civil society, the patients are crucial, and they provide us with this perspective, a space like uh, the World Forum for the Elimination of Cervical Cancer allows us to come together and share experiences and learn from the others, from other countries. We need such spaces to understand the best strategies, strategies to implement and order to advance both vaccination coverage and screening programs. So you've really you know, pointed out the importance, you know, not just of having very strong targets and goals that can be you know, measured and, and really kind of compared across, across different regions or different geographies, but also in some cases the importance of tailored approaches depending on, on people's needs and you know, really in order to improve equity. We're getting very close to our time, but Violaine Mitchell, let me ask you if you could say a little bit about, you know, as we look at some of the lessons across the different elimination agendas, policy recommendations that, that we can really kind of mobilize to, to look ahead. So thank you, and I, I, mindful of time, and also recognize you know, the tremendous interventions um, from my colleagues here. I would say you know, on the policy, it's continuing to execute against the single dose policy. But I think what I would also say is, um, Dr. Ciro de Quadras, who ran the immunization program in the Americas for many years, personal hero of mine, and uh, the late Ciro de Quadras, but when it came to polio and measles, when people were frustrated and it couldn't be done, he just said, focus, we have everything we need, just get it done. And I feel that's where we are with cervical cancer elimination. Let's not put up barriers, let's take them down. So we know what we, we have the tools that we need, we know what we need to do. And we, we can do it. We just need to get it done, <laughs> okay. I hope you'll agree with me that we've heard compelling insights and, and energy and, and motivation about the persistent challenge of cervical cancer in the Americas and the real opportunity at the intersection of technological innovation, 
policy innovation and funding commitments to advance the regional elimination agenda. I want to thank our speakers, Jarbas Barbosa of the Pan American Health Organization, Monica Garcia from the Spanish Ministry of Health, and Violaine Mitchell from the Gates Foundation for sharing their views on how we can turn this ambition and opportunity into a reality. And thank you for joining the conversation. <laughs>